Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi everyone, so today we will be uh, seeing about bioreactors that are used in tissue engineering. So what are bioreactors and what is its function? So bioreactor is usually uh, used to maintain a uh, controlled environment uh, to ensure that a biological reaction can proceed. So for that in turn you maintain the nutrient and product concentration and also you get a uh, high degree of control and reproducibility of these products on using these bioreactors. The role of bioreactors in tissue engineering too is similar to what it uh, normally is used for. So it is to actually initiate, maintain and direct uh, cell cultures in a 3D environment by maintaining that uh, environment uh, and also the aseptic condition. So why use bioreactors? So the aim of tissue engineering has been to get organs or tissues off the shelf wherein you are able to replace a tissue or organ which is damaged by uh, as easy as you buy a prosthetic. The factors which play an important role to making this feasible is the efficacy of the product. So the product has to do uh, what the natural uh, uh, tissue or organ does. Then it has to comply to uh, regulatory standards and also you should be able to produce these um, tissues or organs in a cost effective manner. So this is where the bioreactors come in. So products which are manufactured on the tabletop in a lab, uh, these might be uh, interest, um, useful to study about um, how you can grow these uh, organs in lab, X, Y, O, but to produce it in large scale you would need something like a bioreactor. In addition, such a controlled environment like a bioreactor ensures that we can study in detail on how the tissue development happens um, by controlling all of the parameters and changing whatever we require. Mm, so these are the basic types of bioreactors which are used in tissue engineering. So the first one is a spinner flask wherein there is a, a low degree agitation which is given to the flask. Uh, the second one is the rotating wall vessel wherein uh, the cells remain in suspension and the bioreactor keeps rotating. Uh, so this offers some uh, slight degree of shear stress which is uh, required for uh, cell lines like epithelial cells and all. Then hollow fibers. So these hollow fibers have capillaries which run through them carrying the media and the media can actually diffuse out, outside. And on the outer surface of these capillary tubes there are uh, cells which are uh, seeded on it. Uh, so the spent media is then taken out and it can be recycled and circulated again. Uh, direct perfusion, so that is D. So here what happens is a cell and scaffold construct is placed in the center of the chamber and the media is perfused through it. Uh, so that the spent media comes out on the other side and you can recirculate it or uh, change the media. Then load cell bioreactors. So this is when the tissue that you are growing requires some sort of me mechanical force to grow in the right way like tendons or bones. So you can simultaneously stretch or compress the tissue as they are forming uh, thereby giving it the physiological conditions required for its uh, development. So the basics that we we'll look at is, so what do we need to keep the cells alive? So uh, obviously we need a media and uh, this media needs a carbon source, a nitrogen source, uh, oxygen and serum and other things like growth factors etc. Um, the cells need space to grow and also you need an optimum temperature and pH. So temperature effects. So the optimum temperature required by the cells can vary based on the cell type. So they are divided into three classes based on their required temp temperature. So psychrophiles which require temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius, mesophiles which require a temperature range of 20 to 50 degrees Celsius and thermophiles which require a high temperature um, greater than 50 degrees Celsius. So above this optimum temperature growth rate decreases and thermal death results. So the effect of temperature can be shown by the Arrhenius equation. So 
in that um, this shows the growth rate constant and this shows the death rate constant and using the death rate and the growth rate constant we can calculate the rate of uh, cell concentration um, with respect to time. So the activation energy for um, uh, growth is usually around 10 to 20 kilocal per mole and of death is around 60 to 80 kilocal per mole. So from this we can see that if you can substitute it that thermal death is more sensitive to temperature changes. So te having the right temperature range is quite important. Uh, then coming to pH effect. So pH is basically the H plus concentration which in turn affects the enzyme activity and the growth rate. So mm, these are few of the examples of uh, different organisms and their preferable pH range. So for mammalian tissues it's usually around 6.5 to 7.4 pH. Uh, the cells are capable of regulating their intracellular pH even when there is a variation in the external pH. So there is a buffering system usually for it. Now looking at the main functions of a bioreactor in tissue engineering. So we have a cell source and a scaffold. Uh, so the cells initially need to be seeded onto the scaffold and then um, we should be capable of maintaining the right environment for the cell proliferation and growth and uh, there should be uh, some level of physical conditioning which is required. Um, so it varies depending on the tissue that you are trying to grow. So it can be fluid driven or mechanical or, or electrical conditioning. Uh, and also all these parameters are continually uh, monitored and uh, using sensors and they can be controlled so that the preferable men, um, uh, environment is maintained. So first let's look at the cell seeding part. So traditionally uh, cell seeding was done by uh, dropping the cells onto a scaffold using a pipette. So here you rely on gravity to take the cells into the scaffold. But the disadvantages of this is there would be an ununiform, there would be an ununiform distribution of the cells into the scaffold, uh, and there may not be a complete penetration of the cells throughout the scaffold, and its uh, poor efficiency and uh, reproducibility is also affected. So uh, that is why dynamic cell seeding is used mainly in the bioreactors. So here, what is done is, uh, so here what is done is the, um, it's ensured that the cells end up penetrating throughout the scaffold and they are distributed in a more even fashion. So these are some of the techniques normally used for seeding the cell within the bioreactor. So a spinner flask uses normal mechanical stirring to ensure that the um, uh, cells are seeded completely into the scaffold. Uh, but the spinner flask has some limitations which are mentioned here. So we use wavy wall which has sinusoidal pattern waves can be created because it has irregular, not irregular, a uh, patterned uh, outer uh, uh, layer. So uh, this structure allows for enhanced perfusion of the cells into the scaffold. Uh, then the next one is a rotating wall vessel which we saw before. Amongst the dynamic cell seeding techniques, the most efficient one is perfusion seeding wherein it, it relies on active perfusion rather than using gravity for seeding the cells onto the scaffold. So it can penetrate uh, throughout the scaffold and uh, in a uniform fashion the uh, cells can be seeded. Um, so it has been actually used in converting a porcine heart valve by decelerizing it uh, and decelerizing it with human cells by perfusion. So the main parameters which determine how the cells are seeded are the cell concentration that you use for your seeding, the flow rate of the medium, the flow direction and timing of perfusion pattern. Uh, so currently moreover what is used is a trial and error approach in determining what is the best parameters that need to be used to um, achieve the best seeding. Modeling is quite challenging because each cell type can have a lot of variability. Still there are models which can help us achieve maximum seeding density based on the porosity of the matrices. So maintenance of control culture environment. So uh, a convective media flow around the construct and also perfusion of this media through the pores can aid in overcoming the diffusional transport limitations. Uh, so perfusion can enhance the formation and deposition of uh, ECM as shown in these examples and also improve the cell proliferation in blood vessels etc. 
so um, computational fluid dynamics can be used to design new perfusion bioreactors and also to optimize their operating conditions. But what is required for this mainly is to un, uh, get to know the underlying mechanisms uh, associated to perfusion, uh, underlying perfusion associated cell proliferation. Uh, so um, what is in important for this to happen is to un, um, g get a good grasp on the underlying mechanisms. So uh, the challenges in maintaining hemostasis is an abrupt change in concentration of metabolites and catabolites. So this happens especially in a cul uh, lab culture environment. Uh, the challenge in maintaining homeostasis is the abrupt change in concentration of metabolites and catabolites. So this can be overcome in a bioreactor by using a semi-continuous or automatic replenishment. So thereby there is not a huge and sudden change in the metabolites or the uh, catabolites. Uh, during the reaction. Uh, also, you can use a feedback controlled addition of fresh media. Uh, the physical conditioning of developing tissue, this would be the third aspect that bioreactors need to look at. Uh, so, uh, physical forces as mentioned in the previous talk do play an important role. Different types of physical forces play a role like hydrodynamic or hydrostatic forces, mechanical or electrical forces. Uh, so, the uh, Aim of the bioreactor here would be to simulate these in vivo conditions inside the bioreactor too. So um, some of the basic physical conditions in vivo are fluid driven uh, mechanical simulation wherein a shear stress can be induced on the cells by the fluid uh, especially in the heart valve etc. Um, so also create a differential pressure, uh, we can even combine these two mechanisms uh, especially in making vessels and uh, heart valves. The mechanical condition wherein you give a tension or compression like in bone, cartilage, etc. Uh, and electrical stimuli which is used in cardiac, skeletal and muscle constructs. So the challenges in developing a bioreactor would be that you, we need a very thorough understanding of what is uh, happening in the in vivo condition. And if we can make a computational model of the cell and tissue development uh, in the bioreactor uh, uh, setting and the sensing and monitoring techniques could be improved wherein we can get uh, real time information on how the construct is being developed and what its parameters are like its morphology etc. Thank you.